Greetings and salutations, everyone. Today we're going to take a look at the 1960s in the United States, a transformative period both inside and outside of the country. So let's get started. With Kennedy being elected to office, he was kind of slow to make big movements for civil rights because he needed the votes of both people in uh, African Americans in the North and whites in the South. Because of this and because of where the nation was, it was kind of hard to institute big, giant, sweeping changes all at once. The civil rights movement began, hell, it really began in the 19th century, but by the 60s, it really starts moving much, much faster. And one of the ways it starts moving very quickly is the sit-ins, and that start in February of 1960, where a group of four African-American college kiddos in Greensboro, North Carolina, go in to a diner and sit at a Lunchworth's at a Woolworth's. And Woolworth's was kind of like, a, if you took a JC Penney's and a CVS and put that together, that's kind of what it is. Oh, and they also serve lunch. So these kids come in, sit at the lunch table and are told by you know the waiter and then management, hey, the policy is that the counter space is just for white customers and African-American customers could pick up food at the back and they wouldn't go, they wouldn't leave, they were arrested. And the next day, more people show up, more African-Americans show up and sit at the counter and they're all arrested too. And this continued for to escalate until you had people who would just go in, sit down, and immediately be arrested. And even white patrons who wanted to support the African Americans who were being persecuted like this would support them and sit at the counter for them and posthumously also be arrested. In 1963, the leader of the civil rights movement, arguably, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., is leading a protest in Birmingham, Alabama, and he is protesting the segregation policies that were still in place, the actions towards racial problems that we see, and he is arrested and the Birmingham police say they're putting him in prison because he was inciting a riot. And while he's in prison there, he writes a series of letters called Letters from Birmingham. And in it, he outlines what's going bad in the South, the dangers of basically being African-American in the South during this time. He talks about the lynchings, he talks about the police brutalities, and people show up to support him. The response to this that the Birmingham PD do is they use guard dogs, rubber bullets, fire hoses, tear gas on these protesters, and all of this is captured live and goes out to the world. And this, in conjunction with the sit-in protest, got attention towards the civil rights movement in a way that it had not gotten attention prior. The idea that this person is getting arrested, well, why did that guy get arrested? Oh, he sat down at a counter at lunchtime. Really? That guy in the picture, he has an attack dog being a sect on him. You'd think, wow, what did that guy do to deserve that? Oh, he just wants to be treated like a normal person. Really? Yep. That was it. And the brutality that we see from these cases continues to draw more and more attention to what's going on. After being free from Birmingham, Dr. Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. organizes the March on Washington, and this was a coalition of civil rights, of labor rights, of church groups, and it reflected the degree 
of black-white cooperation to support the injustices that were ha happening here. This is the infamous I Have a Dream speech. I will link this in this YouTube playlist. If you have never heard the entirety of this speech, please do so. It is one of the most powerful speeches of the 20th century. Now, Dr. Robert Martin Luther King Jr. advocated that you should approach this problem with nonviolence. That if you reacted to as bad as things were in the civil rights movement with violence, then the other side would be justified to act even more violent. And then you have this system that just can't be fulfilled any other way than both sides getting more and more violent. And for King, that was his movement. That was his goal. That was his bread and butter. But there were others who believed that what was that this is not working, that a nonviolent approach didn't work. And one of these individuals was Elijah Muhammad. He was the leader of the Black Muslim movement. And he says that people need to be industrious, they need to save money, they need to view all white people with suspicion and view all of them with hate. And that's a really, wow, big statement. The now, Elijah Muhammad led the Black Muslim movement, but one of the bigger leaders would be Malcolm X. And he was born Malcolm Little. He goes to prison, goes, learns from the Quran, converts to Islam, joins the, this movement, and he advocates for separatism. He says that blacks should separate completely from whites that intermixing was not going to happen. The rallying cry for a lot of people in response to both of these militant and nonviolent movements was black power. The idea that the federal government was had utterly failed to stop violence against African Americans. The ideas of this were radicalized into militant groups like the Black Panthers. It wasn't always about activism and fighting back. Sometimes it was about cultural pride and pride in who you were. The symbol of this was uh, what these two guys in the 1968 Olympics are doing, a single gloved fist in the air. When Cuba fell to communism, we see that the CIA began thinking about what can we do to Cuba. I mean, when a communist nation is in Russia and it's the other side of the world, that's one thing. But when it's 90 miles off the coast of Florida, it's something else entirely. And the CIA kind of begins planning this under Eisenhower. Then when Kennedy steps into play, he inherits this problem. And the plan that the CIA wanted to do was they wanted to take exiled Cubans, Cubans who had been in power before Castro and had either left of their own accord or been given the choice of leave or die, train them up and deploy them as a rebellious fighting force that would then take over Cuba. This idea failed entirely. In every way that it possibly could have failed, it did fail. The plan got out to Castro and his people. So when these exiled Cubans landed at the Bay of Pigs, they were surrounded, they were slaughtered and massacred. And very quickly, our role in training and arming and supplying the boats for these guys became apparent because every single thing they owned said property of the United States or property of U.S. Army on it. And 
instantly, as soon as this was done and the failure of it was done, we were also seeing that we were actively trying to depose another nation state. And that wasn't too popular, as you can imagine. August of 61, Khrushchev sees that more and more people are leaving East Berlin for West Berlin and the wall dividing Berlin starts going up. And it, a rudimentary version of it went up overnight and over time it got more and more complex. Taller walls, more guard towers, landmines, machine guns, you name it. And the Soviets also start atmospheric testing during this time. They were good and pissed about how we had tried to take over Cuba and they wanted to show off their new nukes. So that's why that happens. Kennedy responds to this by saying, well, we're going to start building new, new, new nuclear weapons also. They're going to be called Minutemen missiles. And this meant that the missile could go from standby to launch in under 60 seconds. They could hit targets very far away. And we start installing these in Turkey, which is really close to Russia. I mean, it's just there's Turkey, the Black Sea, and then Russia. The proximity of these new missiles to the capital of the Soviet Union pro uh, prompted the Soviets to start installing missiles in Cuba. And this was discovered in 62 when a American spy plane flying over Cuba and wondering, you know, could we actually land troops? Could the U.S. Army invade Cuba? And that was when we realized that the Soviet Union was installing nuclear missiles in Cuba. A week after discovering this, Kennedy announces to the world that there are missiles in Cuba and they're being put there by the Soviets. And this was a very real threat for everyone. And it was the same kind of threat we felt as the Soviets felt when we put missiles in Turkey. This map here shows where the range of those missiles could have gone to. And yes, it could have hit anywhere in that third ring in a matter of hours. Kennedy said that any missile launched from Cuba going anywhere in this hemisphere would be considered a declaration of war by the Soviet Union. And we would respond with a full military retaliation. This was, this was one of those, we're gonna go to World War III moments and it was ridiculously close how this happened. A quarantine is placed around Cuba saying no ship is gonna cross that line and if the ship does cross that line, we're gonna shoot it out of the water until the missiles are removed. The crisis ends with Castro, uh, with, Ka with uh, Khrushchev, the head of the Soviet Union, pulling ships back and saying, okay, we're gonna remove the missiles. We still had more missiles than the Soviets by a factor of 17 to one. The problem though is we both have enough missiles to totally destroy the other and the rest of the world. Following the Cuban Missile Crisis, we see the installation of communication systems between the White House and the Kremlin. And it is a typewriter machine that looks kind of like the one that's in this picture that could instantly communicate from one machine to the other. This was way more secure than a phone call, way more secure than a teletype. It's like a one-to-one -one communication system. We also see that between the Soviets and us, we signed a treaty saying no more atmospheric nuclear weapons. And the hardliners in the Kremlin were so angry with Khrushchev that he hadn't you know, pushed this and 
basically gone to nuclear war, that this is the thing that starts putting Khrushchev on his way out the door. The guy who's going to replace Khrushchev is a man named Brezhnev. Now, Brezhnev, he was old school. He was Stalinistic in power. He starts putting this program into play that we're going to win this war because co communism is superior and those capitalist fools and it, it, it doesn't go well. Less than a year later in Dallas, JFK is assassinated. He is shot and killed by Lee Harvey Oswald. And then before Oswald gets to trial, hell, when he's being taken out of Dallas County Jail, he is shot by a Dallas nightclub owner, Jack Ruby. And the conspiracy theories behind who's responsible for this were really all over the place. Everything from multiple gunmen to somebody using ice bullets to somebody else in the car who had the gun. Cuban nationalist, Vietnam nationalist, every conspiracy theory you can imagine has come forth about this. Ultimately, with JFK dead, the presidency passes to his vice president, Lyndon Baines Johnson. Johnson was sworn in on Air Force One. He was sworn in by uh, the Constitution says you have to be sworn in by a federal judge. And the only federal judge they had on board was a woman. So she swears him in. And that also means that LBJ was also the first president sworn in by a woman, which is just kind of one of those neat Jeopardy facts you've now got. He, Johnson, when he comes to the office of the presidency, he keeps the social programs that Kennedy started going full speed. He carries forth the same policies that Kennedy started to adopt. He, uh, he as president, knows that he wants to continue the legacy of the man who came before him. And this is really amazing because, number one, you only get one shot in the big chair and this is what Johnson starts doing. And number two, remember for years, Johnson and Kennedy were the bitterest of rivals. Some of those conspiracy theories say that Johnson is the one who was behind Kennedy's death. In 64, tax cuts are passed. The Civil Rights Act will be passed at this time. And the Civil Rights Act of 1964 is the big one. This is the one that will outlaw discrimination of peoples based on race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. All of it. It was considered one of the biggest turning points in the civil rights movement. In 64, at the election, Johnson wins really handsomely. Um, his opponent, Barry Goldwater, was there was a lot of mudsling that was done towards him which was not entirely wrong saying that he was pro-nuclear war he was anti-civil rights he was an extremist who wanted to get rid of social security and was willing to go to war if it would mean making the united states a stronger place ultimately johnson didn't have to work too hard to defeat him in 1965 king addresses the fact that yes, the civil rights case of 64 did some good stuff, but more stuff needs to happen. And he starts this march in Selma to Montgomery, drawing attention to the problem of the voting rights. That's there were voting problems that still existed. This led to the 1965 Voting Rights Act, which were and the passing of the 24th Amendment. What these do is repeal poll taxes, meaning you didn't have to pay a tax to vote, and it also lowered the voting age from 21 to 18. The argument for that, for passing for the uh, age change, is the Vietnam War was going on, and it was considered unfair that you could be drafted to fight in the war, but not be able to vote for who's in office. 
One of Johnson's big goals was to make the nation stronger through social means and creating social programs. They might attack, well, poverty, for example. The Economic Opportunity Act was designed to create programs for kiddos in education who needed help the head start upward bound these are programs that are designed to help lower economic families to have something it was a war on poverty and this was the first government sponsored program that included african americans from design to implementation now despite the big successes that this would have had there was a lot of pushback at the local levels saying that this was unrealistic that these expectations were inconceivable and it was going to cost too much money to educate all these people it was just a lot of people weren't happy with this one social change that did last and and really took off after this was the development of Medicare and Medicaid. Medicare being a hospital insurance program for all persons over the age of 65, and Medicaid, which was a grant that was supposed to help people who were financially disadvantaged pay for medical procedures. The 60s are also dominated with the Vietnam War. Now, prior to the 20th century, France had controlled Vietnam. When World War II happened, the French government kind of doesn't exist for a while, and the Vietnamese say, hey, that means we're free, right? And when the war ends, the French show back up saying, hey, we're back and this is still ours. The Vietnamese fight back and drive the French out of Vietnam, the last battle being at uh, Wen Diem Diem, and establish a new election system. The plan was we're going to divide Vietnam the same way that Korea had been divided. There will be a communist north and a non-communist south. The north would be consolidated under Ho Chi Minh. And this guy had a huge background, heavily influenced in Marxism, in communism, and had studied here for a while too. So he took all that to establish North Vietnam. South Vietnam was put up by uh, this guy, Diem. Now, Diem, we liked him at first because he represented a lot of Western values. He was pro-West, he didn't like communism, and he was Christian. So for these reasons, you know, we think, hey, this is great. He's going to be super for South Vietnam. And we first start supporting him a lot. However, he is terrible to the South Vietnamese people. He cracks down on Buddhism, and that's the largest religious group in the region. He uses his power to uh, oppress any uh, anything that's not with him. And the people are so upset about this that Buddhist monks start setting themselves on fire in South Vietnam to draw attention to how bad it is. With the view that, okay, this guy might be friendly towards what we like, but he's terrible for the region, we start really quickly and distancing ourselves from him. And on November 1st, 1963, a couple of Vietnamese generals overthrow and kill Diem. And the conspiracy that this led to Kennedy's death is that, you know, Kennedy died only a couple of weeks later. South Vietnam without Diem was definitely a powder keg situation. One military coup took over immediately, which was replaced by another military coup and another and another. It was just, there was no consistent power in Vietnam. And we put 
some votes in the area fearing that there's going to be a communist revolution that's about to start and one of these ships will be fired on in the Gulf of Tonkin which is in North Vietnam and when that happens a second time the United States is kind of given a blank check to safeguard the region safeguard South Vietnam safeguard Indochina the fear that North Vietnam would push into South Vietnam and communism would spread was justification from Congress to do whatever it needed to be done to handle this problem so Johnson starts authorizing air attacks of North Vietnam and when it gets moving in 65 you have a entrenched group of guerrilla fighters poorly armed against the most powerful military in the world if you were a betting man you would have expected Vietnam to go in the side of the Americans very quickly and we start seeing Americans dropping thousands and thousands of bombs on this region and it was initially just just that just bombing out North Vietnam but our intelligence agents start saying that the bombing campaign isn't working it's actually strengthening the people's will to fight and we realized that just dropping bombs wouldn't be enough so Johnson in July of 65 starts the idea of let's put boots on the ground then and very quickly the undersecretary of state says this this will not win we we will not win we're going to get sucked into a war that will never be successful we but you know that was the, oh, that's impossible how could we lose Vietnam's a tiny country we're big and tough American soldiers found that they were fighting a new kind of enemy in South Vietnam an enemy that didn't wear a uniform an enemy that could run from one battlefield into a village and then well where is your enemy combatant he looks acts and is just like everyone else in the region and then you have stories of very true stories unfortunately of entire villages being massacred there was lots of opposition to the war the repressive nature of South Vietnam before we showed up the heavy use of napalm in the region and we started using napalm with the idea of well we'll just burn out the hiding spots for North Vietnamese soldiers and and when the, the Viet, as you know napalm it kind of spreads to everywhere uh, the use of chemical defoliants like agent orange and the stories of people who came back with being exposed to that stuff the loss of american lives the cost of the war consistently were just things that got people angry about what was going on more and more people continue to gather continue to push back the opposition to the war actually starts gaining a lot of popularity and a lot of traction and so much so that it creates its own movement the counterculture movement the what we reference now as the hippie movement was a byproduct and creation of of the war it was a creation of wanting personal freedoms of saying what the state is doing is wrong and I want to fight back it meant all kinds of things drugs sex personal freedoms the feminine age continues during this time uh, during the 20s we see that women got the right to vote and then we see more and more women are 
accepted into the workplace, but there's still the giant gap between men and women. And one of the things that starts drawing attention to this is this work by Betty Friedan called The Feminine Mystique, which showed historically and culturally the gap that existed between men and women. In 1966, the National Organization for Women is created, and Betty Friedan will be its first president and will go on to start another wave of feminism in this nation. The 60s also transformed the gay movement with creations of being more acceptable, more accepted, to come out of the closet. And I have an entire a video that's in this playlist that goes into more detail about the Stonewall Bar and about the gay movement as well. So check that out if you are interested. Latin Americans who, as migrant workers, found that if they wanted to come to the United States and work, you know, that was that was great and chasing a dream of economic or political freedom. That's that's wonderful. But there were just as many migrant workers who came here who were paid almost nothing, who were oppressed by their culture. And this oppression had both culturally and economically comes to a head with the work of Cesar Chavez, a man who motivated the migrant masses to kind of come together and create a new movement for this group. The Native Americans who had been oppressed for so very long, who wanted to find their own way and place during this time, start their own as well, their own civil rights uh, movement. And one of the things that they do during this time is they occupy the island of Alcatraz prison. In the Fort Laramie Treaty, it said that any abandoned federal property could go to Native Americans and Alcatraz was nothing. I mean, it wasn't even, it wasn't anything at this point. It was not a national park, it wasn't the prison anymore. So they just set up there and say, hey, red power. Environmentalism also starts to spark up at this time and the idea that this is the only earth we got there's no second planet really starts getting people motivated to save the earth and that creates arbor day earth day in 1970. some questions start coming out of how much privacy do you deserve anymore? And these two court cases were all about the privacy of a person, both what could be printed about you and then Roe v. Wade, which is about legal abortions, all about what a individual's personal authority could be. The 60s end with in 19, well, they don't end in 68, but they definitely, 68 was definitely a culminative year for everything. This was the year that the Tet Offensive happens in Vietnam, which was a devastating assault by the North Vietnamese against the South, where the North attacked the South as holistically on the holiday of Tet. Johnson responds to as bad as things are going by saying, I'm not running for election in 68, and that's that's an election year, so that was one of those, oh my goodness. Both Martin Luther King Jr. and Robert Kennedy are both assassinated that year. And when situations in politics are bad, the incumbent party usually has a very difficult problem staying in power, and that is where we're gonna see the return of Richard Nixon. And Nixon had been vice president under Eisenhower, had been a senator, had been an anti-communist lawyer. He garners votes and ultimately obtains a majority. It's a real close um, run 
for the popular vote. Nixon only wins the popular vote by about a half a million votes, but he really wins it in the Electoral College. So, today we talked about the 1960s, 1960 to 68, all the craziness that happens between Cuba, civil rights, Vietnam. Hope you learned something today. I'll see you next time.